Hey everybody, Matt McGee here, your Colorado real estate agent with the Wolfpack Group at eXp Realty. Have you ever asked yourself, how do I go about purchasing a home? What are the steps I take? Who do I talk to? Obviously, aside from talking to your local real estate professional or myself, another good resource is a mortgage lender. Most likely, you're gonna need to obtain a pre-approval in order to write an offer, at least in the state of Colorado. So today, I have a valued partner and an exceptional human, Dane Bentley of Spire Financial on, uh, to talk a little bit about just that. So hopefully you find this episode helpful and insightful. Please comment below with any questions, concerns, or comments. Thanks so much, and I hope you enjoy the, the interview. Hey everybody, Matt McGee here, your Colorado real estate agent with eXp Realty, uh, part of the Wolfpack Group. Uh, today, I wanted to discuss the first steps in purchasing a home. And one of those important first steps is pre-approval and obtaining a mortgage. And to help me uh, through that and kind of the steps in the process, I've got my buddy and business partner, Dane Bentley. Dane, how you doing, bud? Good, Matt. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks a lot. Thanks for taking some time to come on and uh, really appreciate you doing this for us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, getting getting approved for a mortgage is, um, you know, a lot of times it's kind of goes backwards in real estate. Uh, you know, people find a real estate agent first, uh, but in, in reality, you need to get pre-approved by a mortgage lender first, and then you can go find a real estate agent, go out and start shopping for homes. Sure, sure. So, um before we kind of dive in, uh, I just want to introduce you real quick. This is Dane Bentley with Spire Financial. Dane, you want to uh, just give the the sixty second elevator speech on kind of your background, how you got to where you are, and uh, yeah, and the brief. Overview. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, yeah, Dane Bentley with Spire Financial here in Denver. We're a local lender, uh, originally from Buffalo, New York. Been out in Colorado for coming on six years. Uh, been in the lending industry. Uh, for coming on to four years. So, uh, you know, through the pandemic and the ups and downs and all that good stuff, um, you know, really consider myself more of a mortgage advisor over a loan salesman. Um, you know, I teach classes to real estate agents uh, to continue keeping their license. Um, I teach first time home buyer classes. I work with a lot of first time home buyers, um, but I have clients all over the state of Colorado and all over, all over the country too. Um, but my approach is kind of just making sure first time home buyers know exactly what they're getting into. You know, I always approve. I always try to do applications over the phone. Every single time I approve somebody, they're getting a full total cost analysis with a video of myself explaining every single term to them. Uh, because as a first time home buyer in, you know, sometimes a competitive market, it can seem overwhelming, um, you know, to kind of get into the nitty gritty of things once you get your credit pulled and start collecting documents and all that good stuff. Yep. And I think that's, uh, that's something not to be overlooked. And that's often how I choose partners I work with is their level of communication and ability to explain things. And that's what I've liked about you is number one, you're on top of the market. You're always looking at rates. You know where things are going for the most part. I mean, obviously we don't have a crystal ball, but you understand, right? And you're able to explain that in layman's terms, which I really like and appreciate. And I find that I've done deals with you know some of my clients where they've used lenders that I haven't referred and it's just been a really, really tricky process, right? So I find that um, often if I'm doing a deal with somebody and I, and I have a relationship with a lender, things tend to go way more smoothly. If there are issues, God forbid, which you know happens in every industry and and it doesn't happen every time, but sometimes it happens. You and I have that relationship, and you've got the relationship with the shared client where you know we can all get on the same page and figure things out, right? So that's another reason. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's vital, definitely vital to have you know good communication between your your mortgage lender and your real estate agent, whether or not it's someone that you know your realtor referred to you or not. Um, but you know, as you know, and, and most any good real estate agent or, or real estate professional knows most, most things happen on the weekend. You know, um, you, you want to be working with the lender who doesn't work for a bank. You want to work, you want to be working with the lender who is hundred percent commissioned because they will work for you on the weekends. If you need a pre-approval letter at 10 PM on a Friday, cause offers are due Saturday morning at 8 AM, you want to be working with a local lender. Who's going to be able to provide that service to you not, you know, um, calling a bank and then waiting for them to get you something on, you know, Monday morning, Yep. they're, they've already chosen an offer, you know, everybody's already seen that house and, and the deadlines are passed. So yep. definitely important to be working with someone who's, who's kind of working around the clock and not just on a nine to five schedule. Sure. So let's kind of retrace to the very beginning, like to so somebody that knows absolutely nothing about buying a home or getting a mortgage, you know, I always recommend pre-approval right away. First things first, ideally, before we start looking at homes, if we've started looking at homes, let's say it was a referral and I don't know exactly where they're at in the process and I've met them and we go see a home and they're not pre-approved, I get them on it stat, right? So I guess from a timing perspective, 
how quickly can you issue a pre-approval? You know, um, in terms of turnaround time, you know, I always say, you know, I, I depending on the day, sure, I can do it in a couple hours. Um, but what I usually tell people is within 24 hours, yep. regardless of if it's Friday night or Saturday morning, whenever we do the application, within 24 hours, I will have a pre-approval back to you. Um, you know, when should you start the process? That That is subjective. It, it, it can be, you know, whenever you're ready. I'll tell you one thing. Um, having a conversation with a mortgage lender is totally free. It's no obligation. doesn't cost you any money to do an application. And if you think that you might not be ready to pull the trigger for getting that hard credit pull, you can still do a mortgage application with a mortgage lender and you can do a soft pull. Soft pull does not affect your credit score at all. It gives you two of the three FICO scores that you need. And then you can kind of get a gauge like, okay, if my scores come in, okay. Um, you know, maybe when I have a little bit more money saved or, you know, when I move in with my fiance or whatever the case is, you know, maybe at that time it's ready to, we'll be ready to do a hard pull and and move on to the official mortgage approval process. Yep. Yep. And then uh, once, I, I don't know if there's a difference from an, a pre-approval perspective with the hard pull and the soft pull, but once there's a pre-approval, how long is their pre-approval typically good for? Yeah. So there is a difference. Um, you cannot, you cannot get an official mortgage approval uh, with a soft pull. You know, you can get a pre-qualification. Uh, pre-qualification, the difference between that and a pre-approval just means you gave somebody uh, an application. You don't have any documents yet. There's no hard credit pull. Basically saying, hey, I make this much money. I have this much money saved. And you say, okay, you're pre-qualified for X amount, you know, if X, Y, and Z checks out. Um, for an official pre-approval, you do need a hard credit pull. Those last 120 days. So a lot of times, I will approve a client, you know, I'll get their documents. I'll have a, I'll have a, a hard pull. So it's an official pre-approval and they might be not super motivated or they don't have to move right away. So maybe 120 days goes by, you know, four months goes by. They haven't found something they love and, and want to put an offer on and get accepted. All we have to do is re-pull the credit at that point and get updated documents. Okay. Uh, a lot of times people are, Oh, I'm, I don't want to ding my credit again. It's, it's going to, it's going to cause a significant, um, you know, impact on my score. Uh, when you get a hard credit pull, it's really not that significant. Multiple inquiries in a row over a long time span are going to be significant. But, um, you know, one hard credit pull is really only a few points. Yeah. Um, and we do take the middle score of the three FICO scores. Okay. All right. Perfect. And because we're along these lines right now, uh, you know, I kind of had an outline for what we want to talk about, but it kind of fits right in. To, to do the pre-approval or the full underwriting, like what type of documents will you need um, from a client in order to approve a loan? Yeah, so generally uh, upfront, mortgage lenders really only need uh, two pieces. Um, and it, again, it depends on what type of income you receive. So most people are W-2 um, borrowers, essentially. You know, they have a W-2 salary and they get W-2 at the end of the year. All we need for W-2 borrowers is 30 days of your most recent pay stubs, um, say you just started a brand new job and you don't have pay stubs yet, we can use um, like an offer letter of employment from an employer. Okay. And then in terms of the assets for down payment, we just need to see two months of bank statements for whatever account you plan on using the um, for down payment and closing costs. Perfect. If you are a self-employed borrower, things are a little bit different. Obviously, it's a little bit more strict. Um, if you're self-employed, we want to make sure that you are correctly reporting your income to the IRS. So generally with self-employed borrowers, if you've been in the industry for less than five years, we will get, we will average your last two years of tax returns. Okay. So we'll take a look and we'll average those over a 24 month period. If you've been in the industry for at least five years, a lot of times the automated underwriting system will let you get away with just one year of the most recent tax returns for self-employed okay. borrowers. Perfect. And I'd like to just make a note here it's like I used to tell my borrowers when I was in commercial banking, if you uh, if you have all these deductions and you're not paying taxes, your borrowing capacity is going to reduce. So if you're planning on buying a house and you're self-employed, show some good income, bump it, you know, maybe trim down your expenses for a couple of years to really get your borrowing capacity to, to the point where you feel comfortable that from a purchase perspective, you can get the loan amount you need, right? Exactly. Yeah. I actually just got off the phone with a recent client who um, dealt with the same thing. He's a young kid. He had a decent amount of student loan debt, fine credit, but he's self-employed and he owns a tile business. And he did not report nearly as much income as he made back. This was like 2019 uh, because, of course, he could take home more. You know, he had student sure. loans to pay and everything else. And he's trying to save up for a down payment. So 
um, you know, we got his tax returns and he, he only paid himself like 50,000 bucks, you know? Yeah. So with student loans and, you know, purchasing a home in the Denver Metro area, um, obviously um, a little bit more income would be substantial for the type of, he wanted a single family home with the garage for all of his, all of his tools and everything else. So, um, you know, we just stayed on the right track. I said, Hey, I know it's going to suck next year, but when you do your taxes report, every single penny you made, sure, you're not going to be able to take home as much, but then we're going to be able to use that income to help you qualify for a mortgage. Yep. Sure enough, Dustin followed my directions. He, he uh, reported all of his income the following year. And then we were able to get him a single family home in Littleton. He got an awesome deal on it. Um, nice. you know, he's, and he's, he owns a tile business. He just remodeled the whole bathroom. He redid one of the rooms. He's like, Hey man, is this going to increase the value of my house? And I'm like, yes, that is huge. <laughs> yeah. We're likely going to refinance him later this year when interest rates drop and he's not going to have to pay mortgage insurance anymore because his equity is going to have gone up from doing all that work. And again, self-employed borrower reported his taxes, got on the right track and he's a homeowner now. Perfect. That leads nicely right into the next question from the perspective of, down payment. What, what do people typically need for down payments? Now, I know this could vary depending on loan type, right? Whether you're FHA, you're, you're using down payment assistance, you're a VA loan, whatever. But maybe maybe just in each of those categories, like a VA, an FHA, and a conventional, what would be... And I again, I know, I know the answer to everything is it depends because it depends on income, it depends on credit, it depends on everything else. But like, what, what would you say... Um, I, I just feel like this myth needs to be dispelled because I feel like people need that feel like they need so much money to put down in order. Yeah, to no. Down, and right? I think it kind of is getting a little bit, you know, that myth is getting busted in the last just recent two years, because as we've seen so much social media from real estate professionals, um, you know, I think the average person maybe now knows that you don't need 20% to buy a home. You know, I think five years ago, people are like, Oh, I don't have 20%. I can't buy a home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of what I recommend, uh, especially in the Denver Metro area, save your money. If you have 20%, um, you know, put down five, 10 or 15%, uh, because sure, you're going to have to pay a little bit more for mortgage insurance. Um, and we'll talk about that. If you get a conventional loan and you put less than 20% down, you have to pay a monthly mortgage insurance fee until you reach 20% equity. Now, if you're in an FHA loan, you have to pay a set monthly mortgage insurance fee, regardless of how much money you put down. FHA loans are geared toward borrowers with less than perfect credit but they do have higher ratios. So you can purchase a higher priced home with FHA loans because they go up to 55% debt to income ratios, whereas conventional loans are capped out at 50%. FHA loans also, the minimum down payment required for FHA loans is three and a half percent, 3.5%. Okay. Con conventional, you can get away with 3% down um, as a minimum down payment. VA loans, those are for, um, you know, that's for people that are in the army, retired VA, um, or even active duty. Those, you don't need a down payment at all. You can get 0% financing with VA loans and they don't have private mortgage insurance. Those are some of the best loans out there. Yeah. For now, sure. you, you know, you factor, you know, especially kind of what I've dealt with in the last few years, um, you know, being a millennial with college debt myself, buying my first home in 2020, um, you know, a lot of young people that have student loan debt and if they're coming from different markets, you know, maybe from, from Buffalo or even some suburbs of Chicago, like where you're from or or who knows? I mean, there's transplants from all over the place. The average price home from where a lot of people are, are from is, is a lot less than what it is in Denver. So when they see, oh man, you know, median home price close to 600K in my county and uh, 3% down payment, even the minimum, that's, that's a good chunk of change for a young person. Yeah, There are a ton of down payment assistance options that are great in Denver. There's uh, CHAFA, Colorado Finance Housing Authority. And there's also Denver Metro DPA. These um, these programs give you assistance pretty much. They give you money for the down payment. So all you're really coming out of pocket for are closing costs. I had a young mechanic kid named Rudy, awesome young kid, really hard worker. Um, he bought a house when he was like 22 years old. He utilized Denver Metro DPA down payment assistance. And I think he had to come to the closing table with like $2,300 total <laughs> cash to close, yeah. which was awesome. I mean, his yeah, fiance seems... was like in tears. It was great. Yeah. And then, you know, sure, he might have a slightly higher interest rate because he utilized down payment assistance. But again, he's a 22 year old kid building equity and he's going to be way better off than, you know, if he were to continue renting or, you know, whatever other financial endeavor he would get himself into without utilizing that loan. Yep, for sure. And there are income and limits for those. You know, you have to, um, you know, for, for each program, you can't make more than a certain amount of money. 
um, in order to utilize those, obviously for good reason, should be able to save some money for a down payment if you're making over $150,000 a year. Yep. Yep. No, it makes complete sense. I think everything that we've discussed has been super helpful, especially for you know, people that may not be as well versed as you and I in this and are looking at it all the time and talking about it all the time. I mean, this is our livelihood in our business. We both do this full time and we're, we're in the nitty gritty every day. Right. So for people that may not know, I usually say in Colorado, like a standard, like run of the mill contract is 30 days. Right. And within the 30 day time period, you and I would have the opportunity to converse. Usually we, I would talk to my lender or I'm sorry, the, my, my client's lender, uh, you know, in this scenario, you and I would talk and I would line up appraisal dates. I would line up loan terms. I would line up everything within your guidelines, you know, so that you and I are functioning on the same page from the get go on the offer. Right. Which is another reason that I think the real estate professional and your lender's relationship is important. You need to be able to get a hold of that person, talk through it. Even this is like, you know, pre-contract going under, you know, submitting an offer, you want to be on the same page. So from your perspective, just since I'm talking 30 days, like average run in the mill, what would you say is a typical time frame for things like appraisal, things like, you know, underwriting, things like a clear to close, like what, and this is obviously assuming that the client is getting you the information pretty rapidly. Of course. Yeah. That's, that's the biggest piece of it, you know? Um, and right now it's, it's kind of nice, you know, especially the last two years when things were so crazy and the market was so hot, um, you know, almost every single purchase deal was a shorter t- closing timeline because that's, that's the way to compete. Um, you know, there's a lot of offers on the table and people are really motivated to sell and they want their if they can have their money and sell their house in two weeks over four weeks, sure. Yeah. They're going to do it. Yeah. Um, but you know, that makes things a lot more stressful because then you have to tighten up those deadlines. Borrowers have to get you those documents as soon as possible. Yep. Um, right now, you know, it's a shifted market. 30 day closing timeline is pretty standard right now. And that's pretty normal for most markets. And honestly, I think that's what it should be. It gives yeah. everybody time to get everything done. Um, you know, appraisals typically don't take more than a week. Uh, okay. Most lenders will set the appraisal deadline out um, for like two weeks. Yep. Again, unless it's a super competitive offer, it's like these clients really, really want this house. You know, like um, last year around this time, you know, what I would say is, hey, if you guys are okay with paying for a rushed appraisal, a couple hundred extra dollars, generally an appraisal in the Denver metro area for conventional loans is about $650. Okay. Um, you could pay a couple hundred bucks extra and get it rushed. And then you might be able to get that report back in three or four business days, as opposed to a week or two. And then you can move things farther along in the process. Uh, now, underwriting, it again, it all depends. It totally, if you're a self employed borrower and you have five rental properties and four kids under the age of 18 and, and you pay alimony and child support, that's going to take a lot longer than a single borrower who's W 2 putting 20% down, no debt, et cetera. Yep. Um, you know, kind of what I do, do a lot of the times to alleviate that stress. And a lot of uh, good mortgage lending companies will offer this is you can get what's called a pre underwritten approval. So um, you can collect borrowers documents up front, which you should be doing anyways. You can actually send those to the underwriter, get a full income and credit check. And then at that point, you can speed up the closing timeline because you're, you know, they're already approved up to a certain amount. All you have to do is get the appraisal, get the inspection, lock their interest rate. And then it's kind of set and forget, you know, like when things were super competitive, 2020, 2021, the first half of last year, I'm pre underwriting almost every single one of my clients because not only can you speed things up and make it less stressful, you can also waive some loan objections. Yep. You know, so if we're offering on a property that has 10 or 15 other offers and, you know, we're going 50 K over really strong offer, you know, we can waive the loan objection date if somebody is already pre underwritten. Yep. And then, you know, the listing agent's going to see that and say, oh, wow, they're good to go. They can close in two weeks. There's no loan objection date. As long as that appraisal comes in at value this is a done deal. Yeah. You mentioned something there like with current timelines that struck a chord with me and it's, you know, looking at 30 days with like a two week appraisal is comfortable. And I like that because it gives me the opportunity to do a quick inspection and perhaps know whether or not the clients are going to move forward and not potentially spend that money if they don't have to. Right. Like, yeah. So if you schedule inspection and appraisal on the same day, it's like, if the inspection comes back bad and they already did the appraisal, your client's out 1200 bucks and they're terminating the contract. And you know, who knows, maybe those clients are using down payment assistance and they're scratching pennies already. Yeah. 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 So I really like, you know, trying to line those things up as best as possible. So the dominoes start to fall in the appropriate order to the point where 
you know, now that's the one nice thing about this market is that it's starting to balance a little bit more. So we have a little bit more time. We maybe even have a little bit more negotiating room. We are, we have the ability to knock out the appraisal followed by, or the inspection followed by the appraisal. Right. So I, I think that that just alleviates, like you said, alleviates a lot of stress, uh, really helps out the, the, both our clients, right. From a financial perspective, as well as a comfort perspective and allows everybody to get on the same page. Um, also too, uh, one thing to keep in mind is interest rate locks have time periods. Generally, okay. it's a, generally it's a 30 day lock. A lot of mortgage companies will give you a free two day extension. And then if you want to be super safe, if you have a, you know, 31 day closing timeline or something, you can do a 45 day lock, but the longer the lock period, the more expensive it is. Okay. So it does cost a few hundred extra dollars to extend your lock a week or two. And that's something to keep in mind, you know, Time kills deals. Everybody knows that. If yep. you know, if if people aren't getting documents in time and we're missing deadlines and, and the rate lock expires, it's never a good thing. So you want to make sure that your rate lock is within a specified time, especially for new builds. You know, some of these new builds, especially last year, I'm I mean, I've heard I've heard a ton of horrible stories of uh, new builds not being done in time because the supply and, and demand stuff with COVID and, and materials not being ready. And you're supposed to close on a certain date. You locked your interest rate. Maybe you locked it for 90 days, you know, three months before that. Hey, the, you know, the windows aren't going to be here for two more months. Your yep. rate lock's going to expire. Interest rates went from three and a half percent to 7% last year. So, you know, if you're getting a new, if you're getting new construction and your closing date is not for a few months out, that is one thing you need to make sure that you are in communi constant communication with your lender and, you know, making sure that you have a longer lock period or that, you know, that construction is going to be done to honor the lock. And I don't think it's going to be as much of an issue in, in this year's interest rate environment because interest rates are going to start to go down. Um, and if you have a long lock and then, you know, it could work out to your favor this year, yeah. you know, who knows, maybe that building gets, maybe your new build gets delayed two months, but interest rates drop another half a point. Then you can break a lock and get, you know, a lower interest rate, lower monthly payment. Is there um, a penalty to break a lock? Sorry, to There interrupt. is. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, there is a penalty to break a lock. Generally, um, it's not as much of an issue if you don't go, you know, too far into the lock period, but every investor is different. You know, it, it could cost, it could be free to break a lock. It could cost a mortgage company thousands of bucks to break a lock and then relock under a new investor with the same property address. Sure. Sure. Interesting. That's good to know. Um, I'm kind of in that situation right now where we've got a new build under contract and, there's some supply chain issues, uh, specifically a subcontractor that we're waiting on to finish some things so that they can move forward with where they're at in the process. And we don't know when the close is going to happen. So we can't lock a deal. Right. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a waiting game, but yeah, you bring up some good points there. I think we talked about this a little bit before, and you know, we have this conversation all the time. What can people expect generally speaking from a closing cost perspective, bringing cash to the table outside of their down payment? Yeah, so um, that's a super important thing to consider, especially for first time home buyers, because they might be thinking in their head, like, man, if I could just save, you know, $30,000, I'll have my, my 3% and then I'm good to go. It's like, yeah, you, know, you got to factor in closing costs. Um, you know, closing costs can range anywhere from three to $6,000 on top of the down payment, um, sometimes more, sometimes less. It all totally depends. Something that you definitely want to talk to your lender about, know exactly what the closing costs are and what they consist of. Uh, because there are multiple, multiple factors. A majority of your closing costs are going to be prepaid items that are placed in an escrow account to pay for your property taxes and your homeowner's insurance. So in Colorado, property taxes are paid twice a year, once in February and once in June, and you have to have a full year of prepaid homeowner's insurance in your escrow account to get dispersed with your monthly mortgage payment every single month after you purchase a home. Now, on top of those prepaid items, which could cost a few thousand dollars, Again, it totally depends on how expensive your property taxes are and how much your homeowner's insurance policy is. Yep. On top of that stuff, you're going to have title fees, you know, um, processing and underwriting fees, essentially the mortgage fees. Those are around $2,000 in itself. You have an appraisal fee. It's around $625. Uh, sometimes if you're purchasing an attached home, like a condo or a townhome, you might have to pay uh, like HOA document handling fees, stuff like that. Um, but again, that's something that your lender will be able to identify and tell you exact. They're, they're going to be able to break down the closing costs and say, Hey, these are total closing costs. Maybe it's $4,500. You know, this is X amount. This is X amount. This is X amount. This is X amount. Make yeah. sure you're going over that with your lender. Um, you know, what you I, can like, do what that I do. once you know a property address, right? 
Yeah, yeah. If you know a property address and you say, hey, you know, I'm approved. Can you run some quick numbers? If I got X amount to put down, what are my closing costs? Yep. Um, that's that's pretty simple stuff to do. All right, great. Cool, man. Well, hey, I really appreciate it. I think we've kind of touched on pretty much everything I have in a rudimentary perspective from the perspective of getting a mortgage and uh, buying a house. Um, and we've kind of talked about this a little bit up front, but I just want you to tell everybody, you know, in your eyes, what kind of sets you apart from everybody else in your industry? Like I kind of have my idea of what sets me apart from a realtor as we're a dime a dozen, you know, and you kind of always have your thing. And I, I personally know what sets you apart, but why don't you, uh, why don't you just kind of say like what you pride yourself on? Yeah. Again, um, you know, kind of just the advice piece, you know, the mortgage advisor over a loan salesman. If I have a conversation with somebody on a Saturday morning and it takes me two hours and I'm pointing them in a different direction in terms of, you know, using cash or, or alternate financing that I can't provide, but I know it's going to be better for my client in the long run. I'm going to tell them to go that direction yep. um, because sure, it might suck to not get commission from that deal directly, but they're going to think about me down the road in the future. And they're going to say, Hey, Dane gave me some awesome advice. He's a great lender. Um, the other thing too, is I'm always, always available. My office phone is my cell phone. Um, you know, I'm around all weekends. I'm not married. I don't have kids. Um, you know, if I'm, I'm a, I'm a huge snowboarder and I'm big into lacrosse, I coach lacrosse and I leverage both of those spheres, uh, very well in the Denver Metro area. And that's what I do most weekends. Uh, but again, I'm very transparent. I'll say, Hey, what, let me know what you need on a Saturday morning, Friday night, you know, Sunday evening. Um, I'm always around, always available. And I'd like to think I'm, uh, I'm pretty cool to work with as well. A lot yeah, of people sure. are, you know, get concerned with, um, you know, their finances and sharing all this personal information. Um, but I really do try to make the process as seamless as possible, especially for first time home buyers, you know, because most of the time that is the biggest purchase they're making in their lives at that point. And it's going to be the biggest payment they have. You know, it's going to be what they're contributing a majority of their income to every single month. Moving yeah, forward. it's going to be how they build wealth, right? You know, it's going to be a large contributor to their overall net worth. Well, hey, man, I really appreciate you taking some time out of your day to have this discussion. Uh, for anybody that's watching this, why don't you just tell people how they can find you? Yeah, so uh, just Dane Bentley, Spire Financial on Google. Uh, my email is dbentley at spirefinancial.com. Office phone and cell phone number I've had for years is 716-208-2661. Feel free to call, text, email me whenever. Again, I'm always available. If I'm not available, I'll let you know when I have some time and we can have a conversation. Again, it's no obligation. It doesn't cost you anything to get approved for a mortgage. And um, just make sure you start that conversation. Don't don't be scared. Right on, man. And, and for anybody watching this, uh, both of us, we do uh, most of our business in Colorado, but we have referral partners nationwide. So don't feel free to, or do feel free, I should say, to reach out regardless of where you are and we'll be able to help you. So uh, Yeah, we're licensed all over the country, I think. There's only um, 11 or 12 states in the whole country that we're not licensed. And I've done loans in Utah, Florida, back where I'm from in New York. So um, yeah, let us know. If it's not Colorado, we'll get you connected. Cool, brother. Thanks a million. Enjoy the rest of your day. Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. See, see you, buddy. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found it as informative as I did, helpful, uh, hopefully can guide you as to steps, timing, process, cost, etc., for obtaining a mortgage in order to purchase a home. Here at uh, EXP Realty in the Wolfpack, we look at real estate as a valuable resource to exponentially increase your wealth. So hopefully you found this insightful. If you have any questions, feel free to drop a DM below. Like, subscribe, comment as always, and I'm here for any help. If there's any particular information that you would like me to do a topic on, please feel free to DM below Below because I'm always looking to do videos on topics that my customers, clients, and people who are interested in my channel want to see and hear. Thanks so much.